Thank you, thank you, Sue, and thank you all for, for your interest and for being here. Uh, I'm going to fly through this because of a lack of time. I apologize for that. But uh, uh, although I'm here for the orchids, I, I want you to know that uh, the place where I work is full of other things as well. It's not just orchids. I, uh, I'm living in this town called Banos, which is on the edge of the agricultural frontier. And these days, you might think, you might think all, this, all the conspicuous species of plants and animals have been discovered by now, with centuries of biologists scouring the forests, scouring the whole world to find things. But it turns out that we're discovering more now than we ever have before. And it's not a good thing. It's because of the, we're, we're riding the wave of deforestation around the tropics. And the biologists are cataloging things just as they get destroyed. Uh, that's true in my area. You can see the agricultural frontier has completely denuded the area around my town. Way in the mountains and the clouds, there are still interesting things. And those are the things we're trying to preserve. Uh, my town is on the base of this volcano, very active, uh, on the edge of the Amazon basin. We often think that the Amazon is the paragon of biodiversity, but in fact, there's as many plant species in the Andes, in, this, in the northern Andes, as there are in this whole Amazon basin, as many plant species. So, in fact, there's a much greater concentration of species, much more important conservation issues here than in the Amazon. And we'll see every little place in the Andes is different from every other place. That's why the diversity is so high there. Uh, we have amazing geology, amazing topography, very wild topography. Uh, and of course, all the good stuff is always at the very tops of the mountains. Uh, it takes a long time to figure out how to get there. But we have, we have uh, wildlife like the endangered spectacled bear, mountain taper, uh, mountain lions, woolly monkeys. These are very big primates. Almost, almost human looking. And we even have eagles that carry off these, these big primates. Our guards have seen these eagles flying through the air with primates, with these woolly monkeys uh, in their claws, imagine. This is the uh, uh, black and chestnut eagle. And uh, beautiful snakes we have, uh, deadly but beautiful. <laughs> Amazing creatures. Uh, many of these photographs that I just showed you and others uh, are taken by our guard, one of our guards, Luis Ricalde, whose uh, salary is paid by the World Land Trust's Keepers of the Wild program. So if any of you contributed to that, this is the sort of uh, person that you're supporting. Excellent. He's become a, an expert wildlife photographer and an expert uh, uh, conservationist. Um, I'll just have to, I, because of the time, I'm just going to fly through these and just show you some of the beautiful things that are here. Uh, endemic orchids, new to science. Uh, this is a new genus, even, uh, which we named Quichua after the, uh, the main ethnic group of Peru and Ecuador. Uh, the genus I study, one of the genera I study, Lepanthes, is so diverse that there's more than 100 species in my little valley. Which is, it's an amazing diversity of, of, of plants. And about a quarter of those were new to science, that I, things I discovered. Um, it's a wonderful thing to search through these forests uh, and try to look for these, look for these tiny orchids. They're, uh, they're, the flowers are under the leaves, so you have to, you have to recognize the leaf and then turn, under the, turn the leaf over, and you're surprised by these incredibly intricate beautiful, uh, fascinating flowers uh, that are just very, very dramatic. And it's not just the fact that there are interest, interesting species here, as they're doing something interesting in evolutionary terms. We're finding, I'm discovering uh, radiations of closely related species, quite similar to what, what Darwin found on the Galapagos with his finches. These are uh, evolutionary explosions, radiations of of uh, closely related species. These three, for example, are very closely related. You can tell that they're all cut from the same cloth, but they are uh, uh, separate species, distinct species, that have radiated in, the, in these forests on these cloud islands. Uh, another 
example of evolutionary radiation that, I, that we discovered here. All of these are new to science. They're all each other's closest relatives. We have an explosion of, we have a biodiversity generator here in these mountains. Um, the most exciting thing I discovered when I finally figured out how to get to the tops of these mountains was uh, a genus, well, I couldn't even recognize them when I found them. I didn't know what genus, what genus they were in. And I'm supposed to be an expert on orchids. I'm not supposed to uh, be at a loss for words when someone shows me an orchid. But uh, I couldn't tell what genus it was. It wasn't closely related to anything I'd ever seen. And the weirdest thing was that uh, it wasn't just this one, one plant, one species of this genus. Uh, these leaves creeping through the moss represented in that one, about one square meter of moss, four or five new species of this strange genus that I couldn't identify. There's this one, there's this one, another new one, all these, all these on the same mountain, almost in the same spot. An astonishing evolutionary radiation, more interesting to me than, than almost any of the standard radiations that biologists talk about in their textbooks. Uh, and all of these grow together. In the Galapagos, it's easy to understand why, why the finches radiated into new species on different islands, because they're isolated from each other. Uh, here, what's going on? How come there can be so many different species in one spot that have appeared to have uh, locally evolved in this one spot and are found nowhere else in the world? Uh, well, that was one mountain, but there's, I'm surrounded by mountains in that place that I live. So uh, I, I tried to find, tried to see what was on top of these other remote mountains, and when I figured out how to get to them, I discovered that once again, uh, there was the same genus, but they had radiated into different species on those mountains. These, 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 all new to science. Uh, 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 extraordinary. Uh, still lots of mountains there, still left to, <laughs> to describe. Um, these mountains right here, uh, I. I was lazy and I, got, I, I was able to convince some students to go up them instead of me. <laughs> uh, they wanted a challenging project, so I sent them up there. They said it was, I sent them up there for a week. They figured out how to get up there. And uh, they said it was the hardest thing they'd ever done in their lives. Uh, one of the women lost her toenail from the constant uh, climbing through deep mud. They almost died of hypothermia. Uh, they might, might well have died of hypothermia, except that the local person I had sent with them um, offered them a bottle of hot sauce, Tabasco sauce, and they say, he said, drink this, and, and, and it jump-started their metabolism and saved them from freezing to death. <laughs> so, so if you learned one thing today, keep that in mind if you ever need it. Uh, so, so they came back after a week and dumped the uh, orchids, the sack of orchids on the, on the, on the ground. Uh, I had taught them how to recognize this mysterious genus, uh, which is called Tegia, and uh, they brought back a specimen of each of the types of tegia that, that they had found on that mountain. Every single one was new to science. Every single one. And every single one is dramatically different from the ones on the other mountains. There's this one, this one, this one, this one. This one I'm going to name after the woman who lost her toenail. <laughs> and that wasn't the end of the mountains. They're in this very small area, there are quite a lot of mountains. And uh, by this time, I had scared off my volunteer students. So, <laughs> so I had to go to this one myself. Uh, it's a long walk, but when I got to the top, uh, beautiful forest, very, very beautiful forest. Uh, this is, these orchids live above 3,100 meters elevation. So we're talking about, often they freeze at night. We're talking about very cold, very difficult conditions. Uh, and on this mountain, there were 16 species of these orchids, uh, all new to science, uh, and all growing together. Should back this up. Uh, well, uh, extraordinary variety. And here's a family portrait of some of the new orchids in this genus. You can see they're different sizes, different colors. They're very, very dramatic. One of the most dramatic orchid radiations, one of the most dramatic plant radiations on the whole planet. So very exciting thing to see, very exciting thing to discover. Um, I would talk much more about this. Uh, I had intended to talk much more about this, but there's no time. So uh, we did genetics. Uh, this very, the reason we have these orchids in, these, in this spot and nowhere else in the world appear to be uh, interactions with the clouds. The, the wet Amazonian winds come off 
and our, our, come off the Amazon and, and go, up these cloud, go up these mountains and produce stationary clouds on top of the mountains. These stationary clouds are part of the topography. The, the, the atmosphere and the, to, and the topography are combining here to produce islands of unique habitats that are uh, very fragile and very isolated from each other. And this is what's driving the evolution of these special orchids, which can only survive in these super humid, special places that have constant mist passing over them, passing through them. So uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to give you my evolutionary radio, uh, lecture, but, oh, but I do have to tell you that. So because of all the special things, the orchids, the, the f new frogs, new, new snakes, new other things, because other things also evolve endemic species when there are these kinds of forces of evolution at work. Uh, we formed this foundation called Ecominga, uh, which became a partner of the World Land Trust, and that was the key to our, our moving forward to do serious conservation in the area. So we've been buying up forests in each of the spots that have these special orchids, and it's turned out that these, special, these spots also have special frogs, snakes, etc. And we're also building a corridor between two national parks here so that the spectacled bears, the tapers can move through them and, uh, and other wildlife can use these corridors, rather like the elephant corridors that, that uh, Vivek was talking about. Um, so how do we thank donors? We've, we've been very lucky. We've gotten great support from the World Land Trust. Um, Linnaeus, whose specimens we just visited, as Vivek mentioned, uh, used to name orchids after his, his sponsors, his, uh, the people who helped him with his research. What better way now to, to thank donors by actually naming orchids after the people who are protecting their own, the habitat that these orchids live in. So, so that is what we are starting to do. We've already done quite a few uh, not just orchids, we've named some frogs after some of our, some of our uh, major donors uh, and some of our uh, World Land Trust board members. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> named uh, this beautiful tree after David Attenborough. Sir David, Sir David in recognition of Sir David's uh, extraordinary, extraordinary help in, in all of the World Land Trusts actions, uh, presented this last time I was, a couple of times ago in London. And uh, um, we found that tree in company with one of the other partners, uh, one of the other sponsors of, of the World Land Trust, uh, Pure, uh, Puro Coffee. Uh, um, and uh, so we've named, that was, that was uh, Andy Orchard in the picture there. He came to visit us and, and we discovered da Sir David's tree together. Uh, now we've named an orchid after, after Puro Coffee and also after uh, Albertino Abela's uh, mother. And we have some, na some names in the, in the, still in the pipeline. And these are some of the beautiful orchids that we still have to decide uh, who, who to name after. So I want to thank, uh, again, the World Land Trust with all my heart for making all of this conservation possible. And thank the people here on, this, on the list. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a film, just a short two-minute film, uh, taken by Johnny Liu and uh, Jeremy Valender, who's in the audience here, and v Viva Vava Ribeiro, who uh, came, suffered, climbed those steep hills, and made a, a very evocative short little film of what the habitat and the orchids are like there. So without further ado, uh, could you play the film and I'll sneak away?
I'd spent a lot of time in forests alone, sometimes up to six months living in a tent in the middle of nowhere. And when I first came here, the things that impressed me initially were the big trees, the strange otherworldly atmosphere that we have here. But when I started learning in a very primal way to see the details of a forest, I started realizing that this really was a very special, unique place. I feel very comfortable here. This is my home. The genus Tegia only had six species in the whole world when I first started walking through these forests. And in the course of my work, I discovered a total of about 30 new species of Tegia. This is an unbelievable amount of evolutionary activity in a very small area. Our foundation is called Echo Minga. Well, there's a Kicho word called Minga, which means lots of people coming together to do a task for the common good. We have changed totally, because now we just only focus on what is the reserves. Now, as instead of caravans, we have cameras. When we go to the woods, we Eh, no se lleva la cámara, es como que se estuviera desarmado. As our relationship has grown between the guards and, and Ecominga, they have been our spokesperson in the community without our asking. They, they've been fighting for conservation. This was on the edge of the agricultural frontier when I first started exploring this forest. The, pastures were being enlarged. The agriculturalists at the lower elevations were working their way up the mountain. Along with that, there was hunting here. There are endangered animals here, like the mountain taper and the uh, spectacled bear. All those things cried out for conservation. And the World Land Trust has continued to look for ways to preserve not only this reserve, but six other reserves that we have in the valley of the Rio Pastaza. So Candelaria Reserve will be a living museum where scientists can come and try to understand the deep mysteries of the theory of evolution. It'll be very valuable for future generations. There's a long history in botany of scientists naming new species after their sponsors, sponsors of expeditions, sponsors of their own work. I can't think of a more appropriate way to name an orchid nowadays, in these days when forests are disappearing. What better honor than to name an orchid after a person who's donated to protect the very area where the orchid grows. <laughs>